It was under the watchful eyes of tens of thousands of people that the coffin of Queen Elizabeth II arrived at its last resting place, Windsor Castle. The UK and the rest of the world said a final goodbye to the monarch whose 70-year reign defined numerous generations. This was the last ceremony after 10 days of events steeped in ancient tradition. The coffin was followed into church by generations of the Queen's descendants, including King Charles III, the heir to the throne, Prince William, and his son George, second in line. The royal family was surrounded by over 500 foreign dignitaries during the mass in Westminster Abbey. Some 4,000 military personnel were mustered to parade on the streets of the British capital. The current Prime Minister, Liz Truss, gave a reading from the Holy Scriptures during the Mass. Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? This comes as the UK braces for a normalcy without its beloved Queen, who will be laid to rest next to her late husband, Prince Philip. By 2025, Uganda will have its oil coming out of the East Africa crude oil pipeline as planned. The comments of leader Yoweri Museveni reaffirmed his determination to have the project completed. His reaction came Friday following a resolution by the European Union's parliament urging the international community to exert maximum pressure on Ugandan and Tanzanian authorities, as well as the project promoters and stakeholders to stop oil activities around Lake Albert. Uganda is estimated to have recoverable oil reserves of at least 1.4 billion barrels. In February, the China National Offshore Oil Corporation and Total Energy said that the total investment would be more than $10 billion. Kampala says oil wealth can lift millions out of poverty when environmental NGOs like Friends of the Earth evaluated that over 120,000 people will lose land to make way for the project. Museveni said Total Energy had assured him that the pipeline, which would link oil fields in western Uganda to the Indian Ocean port of Tanga in Tanzania, would proceed, but warned on Twitter that if the French energy group was to choose to listen to the EU parliament, Uganda shall find another partner. The Ugandan Ministry of Health confirmed Tuesday an outbreak of Ebola virus disease. The confirmed case, a 24-year-old man, passed away on Monday. He lived in Mubende district, located 150 kilometers west of Kampala. When he reported to the hospital, he had the symptoms suspected to be of COVID. The patient was isolated, I mean Ebola. He was isolated. The sample was taken on 18th. Of September, the results came back yesterday evening to confirm the Ebola, the Sudan strain. It remains unclear how the victim became infected. The World Health Organization said Uganda last reported an outbreak of Sudan Ebola virus in 2012. The authorities are closely monitoring the situation. In the same village, earlier, we, we, we got information regarding the community deaths which our epidemiologists went on ground to ascertain. Unfortunately, they were not confirmed, they were buried. However, the pattern is, it was within the same family, three adults and three children. According to WHO Uganda, eight suspected cases are currently receiving care in a health facility. Dr. Diana Atwini urged the public to remain calm as she spoke to the press in the capital. I want to assure the public 
and the international community that Uganda is well known for handling epidemics. And therefore, we have capacity, we have the skills, we have what it takes to contain this Ebola. And so we want to ask to stay calm and, and let you know that we are going to handle this epidemic precisely. Ebola spreads through direct contact with the blood, organs, and other bodily fluids of infected people. Authorities in DR Congo, which neighbors Uganda, said in August a new case of the virus was linked to a previous outbreak. Republic of Senegal and invite him to From rising prices to warming planet and deadly conflicts, the global state of affairs is dire. Speaking Tuesday at the 77th session of the UN's General Assembly, Maki Sall, the Senegalese president and chairperson of the African Union, insisted on the threat of terrorism. Terrorism gaining ground on the continent is not just an African matter. It is a global threat that falls under the primary purview of the UN Security Council. The guarantor of the collective security mechanism under the UN Charter. During the first in-person General Assembly since 2020 and the COVID outbreak, Sal reiterated Africa's call for a better representation of the continent on the world stage. I would like to remind you of our request for the African Union to be granted a seat within the G20 so that Africa can at last be represented where decisions that affect 1 billion 400 million Africans are taken. The Senegalese president called once again for sanctions imposed on Zimbabwe to be lifted. Did the Ethiopian National Defense Force and the Tigray's People Liberation Front fighters commit violations amounting to war crimes under international law? Yes, according to a UN report unveiled Monday. Ethiopia's permanent representative to the UN in Geneva rejected Tuesday the findings of the investigators. The report itself is self-contradictory, self-contradictory and biased, which doesn't uh, um, uh, pay any attention to the atrocities committed in Afar and Amahara region, but solely, solely uh, uh, focusing on Tigray. After almost two years of conflict in Tigray, millions of people lack food. The report claims federal authorities used starvation as a method of warfare. The only source they talk to is the TPLF itself. They wrote in the report what was dictated by the TPLF itself. Otherwise, there is no any single evidence that shows the government of Ethiopia used uh, 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 humanitarian aid as instrument of war. UN investigators conducted interviews during which witnesses testified. Crimes cited in the report include murder and rape. Fighting between government forces and their allies and rebels led by the TPLF reignited in August. The leader of Tunisia's Islamist-inspired Inata party was questioned to the night over alleged complicity in the departure of jihadist militants for Syria and Iraq this Wednesday. Rashid Ghanoushi, a key player in Tunisian politics for over a decade, appeared before a judge after being questioned overnight by specialists from the anti-terror police. Ghanoushi dismissed all the allegations, suggesting Inata's involvement. This whole thing is about something that does not concern us. It is called the shipment of jihadists to conflict zones. All the attempts of the investigators to justify or prove these accusations against the Anata party are indeed in vain, due to the simple fact that the Anata political party has nothing to do with this situation. Rashid Ghanoushi, whom had been exiled for over two decades during Ben Ali's presidency and returned following the country's 2011 uprising, is a key opponent of current Tunisian president Kai Saied. There is an orchestrated attempt by the government to eliminate a political opponent. Anada is the biggest and oldest party in the country. They have failed in the electoral confrontation and in freedom. They have found nothing else but to try and smear us and degrade us by affiliating us with terrorism to eliminate a powerful political opponent.
التخلص من خصم سياسي أصيل وقوي The opposition party Enada played a central role in Tunisia's post-Benali democratic politics until Kai Saied began his power grab in July of last year, which was followed by a controversial referendum that granted him unchecked powers to his office. The Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria raised $14.25 billion Wednesday at a donor conference attended by French President Emmanuel Macron as decades of progress against the diseases are set back by COVID. It was the highest amount ever pledged to a multilateral health organization. Victory against the great pandemics is within our reach, but we still have a long way to go. 38.4 million people are still living with AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis infections are on the rise in Africa, in the Middle East and Latin America. These are the realities we must face up to. We still have a lot of things to do in the coming years and in 2030 we must keep our promise. HIV, malaria and tuberculosis must be gone. The French leader also vowed to continue to fight to lower the prices of drugs by investing 250 million euros over three years in the international drug purchasing organization, UNITAID. I'm happy to announce that we will allocate an additional 300 million euros to the global fund over the next three years, which means that we will invest 1.6 million euros between 2023 and 2025. Since the Global Fund was created in 2002, it has saved 50 million lives and reduced the combined death rate of HIV, tuberculosis and malaria by more than half in the countries where the fund invests.